and the recording has begun. So with that, I will pass things over to Jacob. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Paul and I are thrilled to be spotlighting two of our talented creative writing faculty tonight. Um, we're going to kick off this evening with Gina, who teaches nonfiction in the BA program. So Gina Troisi uh, received an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Maine Stone Coast MFA program in 2009. Her memoir, The Angle of Flickering Light, won first place for the 2021 Royal Dragonfly Book Award for memoir, received a silver medal for the 2021 Reader's Favorite Book Award, and placed as a finalist for the 2022 Maine Literary Awards. Her stories and essays have appeared in Fourth Genre, The Gettysburg Review, Fugue, Under the Sun, Fly Away, Journal of Writing and Environment, and elsewhere. She teaches creative writing here at Southern New Hampshire University and works as a mentor in the MFA in Creative and Professional Writing Program at Western Connecticut State University. So Gina, thank you so much for having us here today. And it's my understanding that you're going to read, if I correct, uh, the, the opening to the memoir. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep, excellent. absolutely. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. So I will uh, pass it over to you and turn off my camera. And um, Lauren, if you'd like to turn off your camera as well, um, and we'll give the floor to Gina and then I think, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. And thank you everyone for being here. And as Jacob said, I'm just going to read from the beginning of my memoir. Um, it's called The Angle Flickering Light, and it was published last year. And the first chapter, I think the only thing I need to tell you um, since it's the beginning is the first chapter is called Left Behind. At five years old, I sat Indian style on the foot of my father's bed alone in his new condo. I'd gathered his ballpoint pens from the desk in the corner and began assessing the pictures of women adorning the pens. They wore spiked high heels, and bright colored leotards and bikinis and blue sequined triangular tops that reminded me of my older sister's dance recital costumes. Their miniature figures pronounced behind sparkles and strings, their bodies splayed into decorative shapes. I tipped them upside down and their sparse garments fell off. They were proportioned women with hardened pink nipples and clumps of dark hair between their legs. I clothed and unclothed them with the flick of my wrist, turned them upside down, then right side up again. They were grown up, like my mother, whom my father had just left. I was mesmerized by these ladies, by their full, buoyant breasts, by the inner curves of thighs that made a hollowed out space for their private parts to breathe. I lay down, watching their clothes fall piece by piece, nestling myself into the cushion of the king-sized bed. The ladies made me think not only of my mother, but also of the faceless women my father rambled on about while out to eat at our favorite Italian restaurant. My sisters and I sat silent, letting him reiterate that Brenda, his secretary, who'd quickly become his girlfriend, had nothing to do with my parents' impending divorce, that he'd been cheating on my mother for years with all kinds of women, including prostitutes. Your mother just didn't want to admit it. She kept her head in the sand. Remember her friend Marla? Marla had lived with us for a while when she needed a place to stay in between moves. I slept with her too. We had an affair for two years while your mother and I were together. Ask her. When we arrived home from dinner crying, we gathered in my oldest sister's room. My mother came in to find us sitting on the bed. What happened, she asked. Krista was 12, so she did most of the talking. He said he's been cheating on you for years, that you knew, that every time he went on a business trip, it was never for business. Well, my mother listened, I kneeled behind Krista and began to pop the cysts on her back. I worked around the straps of her tank top, performing a job I always volunteered for, since she couldn't reach. My sisters talked fast, repeated my father's words, the gestures he'd made, how he acted as if we must have known about his mistresses all along. I concentrated on squeezing, on trying to find the pointed heads on the bumps of her skin. Harder, she usually said, until all the pus comes out, until they start bleeding. 
But today, she didn't tell me what to do, just waited for my mother's response. I can't believe he told you those things, my mother said. She looked at the orange walls, the baskets of necklaces made of white seashells and gold nuggets, stacks of teen magazine and Prince's first albums on cassette tapes. She stood there with a blank look in her eyes, the face of someone who no longer recognized her house or her daughter's bedroom. I waited for the yellowish cream, held a tissue to catch a glob when it emerged. Then the speck of blood. I chimed in. He said he's been having affairs since the 70s. My mother seemed shocked and her lip quivered as if she didn't know what else to say. She made no indication that my father's statements weren't true. She only said, he never should have told you any of that. I liked that I was good at this job, maneuvering these small red mounds, judging when to squeeze harder and when to ease up. I had no worries about scars since no one would be able to see them. And I felt a kind of satisfaction when the sticky fluid appeared, like the purging of something, but I didn't know what. I thought of when my father lived here with us in this brown house on a cul-de-sac where I built snow igloos and plucked frogs from ponds with the neighborhood kids. His blaring records in the living room, John, Dev John Denver's You Fill Up My Senses and Cat Stevens' Morning Has Broken. His teaching me how to scramble cheese and black pepper into eggs. His arriving home from a trip to Japan with red, blue and yellow kimonos for my sisters and me his taking us to pick out a Christmas tree each year. These memories had suddenly become tweaked and clouded, sideswiped by the thoughts of the women he was with on the Japanese vacation with his buddy, who was also cheating on his wife. And a few months back when he and my sister came home from picking out the Christmas tree and she, not understanding that it was a secret, said, Brenda got the good one, my mom's head jerking toward him her face hot with anger. Already, I had grown used to my father's absence. My mother still drove me to kindergarten, the little friend's learning center in the mornings. When she picked me up in the afternoon, she still wore her jogging clothes and we still sang along to Lionel Richie's All Night Long and Laura Branigan's Gloria on our way to pick up my sisters from dance lessons. The only time I had counted on seeing my father was before he left for work in the mornings. After he brushed his teeth with baking soda and shaved his face, stuck a piece of tissue on the spot on his chin where he constantly cut himself, he tied his tie and grabbed his briefcase. I'd stand in the living room crying and say, please don't leave me, over and over. He'd throw me up to the skylight and catch me, then give me a kiss, and walk out the door. In the condo, I lathered my five-year-old legs with Nair hair removal cream and glided my sister's razor up the front of my shins. I knew what women were supposed to look like. I was used to seeing naked ladies, their shapes embellished in the molds of ice cube trays my father kept in the freezer, their silhouettes knitted into his black winter hat to make their own white space their blank faces and prominent breasts hugging his head. During the year my father lived at the condo, we arrived to find notes trailing from the front door and into the living room, through the hallway and up the stairs to the bedroom, finally reaching his bed. I sounded out the repetitious lines for my lover and from your lover that began and ended each vignette individual notes taped neatly around pieces of uneaten chocolate. We picked them up, but didn't unfold the paper to see the messages inside. And he laughed as we gathered them together, piling them on the desk in his bedroom. We knew then that we would be moved out as Brenda moved in, our roles in his life diminishing, our important jobs of holding wallet, money clip and keys in our small purses obsolete. She'd be the one going for four wheel drives in the woods with him, taking trips to the dump with garbage bags covering the windshield while he stuck his head outside the driver's side window to see the road. She'd go sailing with him, 
And when the boat tipped over, she wouldn't be the one caught underneath the sail, gasping for air, terrified that no one would find her to pull her up. We, who had not yet grown into women, would be left behind. Not long after that day in my sister's bedroom, I accompanied my mother on a shopping trip to Lowman's, her favorite department store. I trailed be behind her between racks of clothes, touched the ceramic hands of poised mannequins, and followed her into a dressing room lined with mirrors, into a separate stall big enough for the both of us. Now that my father had moved out, she was shopping for clothes to wear to, to interviews for a job she would hopefully find. She was preparing to return to work after having stayed home for several years. I sat on the bench in the dressing room, my short legs jingling over the platform while she slipped a blouse over her head, adjusted her shoulder pads and nodded at her green eyes in the mirror. I smiled at the shade of blue silk awaited the ice cream she promised to get me after a day of being good, of letting her take her time. My mother's eyes seemed lit up as she checked herself out in the mirror, turning to her left and right, slipping her stockings off and sliding her slender feet into red flats. I realized now her wide eyes were most likely a sign of high alert, anticipation of the upheaval to come. But that day, my world consisted only of my mother's bright eyes and the mint chocolate chip ice cream I would eat in a few hours. On some level, I must have known that my father was probably off with his mistress or possibly late to pick up my sister who sat at dancing school alone, all of the other kids gone, wondering if he'd ever show, but this was beyond my peripheral vision. Within my lens, in this radiant dressing room with my mother's smooth skin and potential new outfit, Everything still seemed possible. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Gina. That was wonderful. Um, a very, a very powerful opening to a, a very wonderful memoir that I highly recommend everyone check out. Um, I especially like. I mean, I, there's a lot in in that first section and, and rehearing, you know, of course, Brenda's name and remembering all of the things that Brenda um, does later in the memoir, you know. Um, but that that last scene, especially, it captures a really tender moment. I feel like with your mother. Um, even though there's that underlying sense of anxiety and dread that comes with it. And you kind of reflect on that with her eyes, her wide eyes and how, you know, it, it's that fear. And I feel like that scene really does a good job because it kind of sets up the rest of the memoir wonderfully where, you know, there are lots of tender moments explored again and again and again. Um, but there's always this kind of dreaded anticipation on the periphery, like, you know, what what's going to happen next or how how can we get past this? And I think that last sentence, especially just Kind of captures everything that glimmer of hope like you know in this particular scene it's with your mother's you know in this room but like there's a lot of moments i feel like in the memoir where it's like within my lens you know everything still seemed possible to move forward and stuff so thank you so much for sharing that i it, it's wonderful we'll I have some questions for you a little bit later um but for now i'm going to pass it over to paul who's going to introduce uh lauren our next reader And feel free to hop off the camera now too, uh, Gina and I will as well. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gina. That was so wonderful. Thank you. And hi, Lauren. Um, Hello. Lauren is our our second reader for the night. Uh, she is, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, an instructor in the online MFA program. Um, she's the author of. Uh, uh, the novel They Did Bad Things, which uh, received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly in the ALA book list and was an Amazon editor's choice pick and was a book club pick for New York Times bestseller Jenny Lawson's Fantastic Strangelings book club. And it's a wonderful novel that I highly recommend to everybody. Um, I had the, uh, the privilege of uh, blurbing it, um, which I did very <laughs> gladly. <laughs> Um, she's an assistant professor of English at Harcum College in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and also adjuncts for us at the online MFA, as, as previously noted. She resides in Bucks County, Pennsylvania with her dogs, one of whom we heard just a moment ago. 
and whatever, whatever her dogs bark at in the night. Ooh, spooky. Uh, her next novel, which she's going to read from tonight, is The Launch Party, a locked room murder mystery set on the first commercial hotel on the moon. It will be released by Bonnier Zoff in June of 2023. And uh, you can find her on Twitter at Lauren A. Forey. Um, we were commenting before the 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 uh, event actually started that um, the hotel in in your in your book is the Artemis, and of course the the spacecraft that just launched for the return journey to the moon uh, last night is is also the Artemis. So was that intentional on your part? No, um, but she's the goddess of the moon, so it makes sense that. Pretty, pretty much everything related to the hotel, all the room, like the suite names are named after different gods in there. Conch shoes, one of the names of the suites, and I did that before even watching Moon Knight or knowing much about the Moon Knight <laughs> series. Uh, but I will take the free publicity from NASA. So. Absolutely, absolutely. You should, you should see if you can get get some kind of junket from, from NASA <laughs> as, as part of your publicity for the novel. Um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, and then I will come back when you're finished with a couple of questions. Awesome. Well, hi, everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to be reading uh, ex an excerpt from Chapter 4 of The Launch Party. It's a proof copy because the real copies don't exist yet. Um, comes out June 2023. Uh, so like Paul said, it's set on the first commercial hotel on the moon and it is a, a murder mystery. Um, so where I'm reading from is before the first murder happens, uh, one of the people in this scene dies not too long after this. Uh, but to set it up, uh, there's 10 characters in here. I apologize, I am not an actor. I cannot do voices, um, but so bear with me. Uh, but the 10, 10 people have won this trip for the first stay at the moon. So the hotel is just open. Nobody else has stayed there before. Um, so they've just arrived at the hotel from the three day uh, space travel um, from Earth. So they've been on a space shuttle together for three days. They know each other a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me. So they've just, just prior to the moment I'm gonna read, they have just um, watched like an introductory video about what to expect. Um, and they're waiting for the depressurization shaper to unlock so that it can step foot on the moon or in the hotel on the moon. No one saw them off the ship. Not even the ever present PR women appeared. Soon, the 10 of them were all clustered in the pressurization chamber. Without warning, the door slid shut behind them. Another automated announcement came over the loudspeakers. Please wait, pressurization in progress. The anxious, annoying chatter that had filled the ship all morning and afternoon now turned to excitement. Everyone was smiling, even Penelope. She looked down at the metal floor. Underneath that metal was the moon. She was standing on the moon. Her five-year-old self, with the glow-in-the-dark stars on her bedroom ceiling, would never have believed it. Pressurization complete. Welcome to the Hotel Artemis. The large double doors at the front of the chamber slid open. There, in all its glory, awaited the lobby of the Hotel Artemis. They moved forward as a group, oh, awed into silence. Penelope thought she was still looking at the video. How could this be real? An orchestral version of Fly Me to the Moon played softly in the background. The floor was made from a special type of see-through material that mimicked glass but was much sturdier so that the surface of the moon could be seen beneath their feet. Slightly to their right, a large curved reception desk of gray marble dominated the lobby. On the left-hand side of the reception desk rose a grand staircase that led to a balcony above. The staircase, also made from gray marble, mimicked the moon's surface. To the right of the desk was the hotel shop, a glistening display of silver and gold shining objects lined up to commemorate the Hotel Artemis experience, all available for purchase. What drew the eye, however, was the far wall beyond the staircase, a seamless two-story window revealed the moon's horizon and beyond it, Earth. Earth like they had only seen it in pictures, an illuminated blue globe, a beacon of light in the utter blackness of space. The view was so clear, it was like there was no separation between them and space, like they could walk right out of the hotel and onto the moon. Something smacked against the hotel's floor. Ow, Allison exclaimed. She tripped over a suitcase. What the? 
Initially lost in the magnificence of the view, no one in the group had noticed their luggage piled near the pressurization chamber. All 10 bags clustered together like a wart on a beautiful face. Weren't our bags supposed to be taken to our rooms? Allison asked. Perhaps, said Dr. Weiss. There are a few kinks in their system that remain to be worked out. Yes, Tanya said, staring at the vast, spacious, and as Penelope was realizing, very empty lobby. Like the staff remembering what time they're supposed to turn up? Save for the 10 of them, the lobby was completely empty. Except for Fly Me to the Moon, the hotel was silent. Everything looked exactly as it was supposed to according to the video, except no one else was here. Bobby called out a booming hello. The only response was an echo. Slowly, they drifted to various parts of the lobby, too shocked, too unsure to say anything. Bobby and Jackson walked towards the main restaurant, The Harvest, located to the left of the pressurization chamber, its entrance facing the reception desk. Dr. Weiss and Allison went over to the hotel shop, Sasha remained in the center, chewing her pen while Uchida examined the reception desk. Penelope ended up at the observation window, staring at Earth. But instead of being awed at the sight, of feeling the gratitude for Earth being so far away, the fear that had plagued her for the last three days reemerged. Freddie joined her at the window. I don't like this, she said. Is the ship still here? Her voice caught in her throat. She turned from the observation window and said it louder. Is the ship still here? Though she didn't shout, her voice echoed as much as Bobby's had. The group all glanced at each other, as if they hadn't before considered the possibility of asking that question. No, Frau Richter answered, look. She pointed to a screen on the wall by the doors to the pressurization chamber. It showed the view outside the docking station, the ship already in the distance. They moved fast, didn't they, said Jackson. I thought they weren't due to depart until tomorrow. Is there any way to reach them, Penelope asked. Any radio or something? She curled her hands into fists to hide the fact they were shaking and looked at Uchida, who remained near the reception desk. The emergency signal, Allison called out. The video said there was an emergency signal somewhere, right? We need to find it, Penelope said. Wait, Bobby shouted. For what, Penelope asked. If we don't call them back now, it'll take days for anyone to rescue us. She's right, Freddie said. I agree with Detective Strand, Uchida said, which surprised Penelope. Not that he agreed with her, but that he knew her name and occupation. Rescue us? From what? Bobby spread out his arms. From the most luxurious hotel in the world? No, sorry, not the world, the universe? But something's wrong, Penelope said. Can't you see that? What's wrong? Okay, so there's no staff here that we can see anyway. But do you know what is here? Our luggage. He patted the pile of cases, then crossed the lobby. And the champagne, freshly poured. See, it's still fizzing for God's sake. And here, do you smell that? He flung open the doors to the Harvest restaurant. Inside sat a large round table set for 10, appetizers already plated with a steaming buffet to the right, overflowing with food. That looks to me like dinner is served, don't you think? The guests looked uncertain now. Penelope glanced at Allison, who shrugged. What I mean is, we don't see anyone. But does that mean there's no one here? Bobby smiled. Oh, come on. I might be the only one here who's been on a reality show, but it's obvious, isn't it? No one said anything. This has all been staged. It's part of the plan. What plan, Penelope asked. Whose plan? The company that owns the hotel, the Apollo Group. Come on, you saw the media hoopla that they put us through ever since our names were announced. The amount of coverage we've gotten on the news, you think they're gonna give up all that publicity now that we, the first group of commercial travelers to the moon, have arrived? Everyone and their mother wants to know what we're doing up here. Are you saying they're filming us, Penelope asked, that everyone else who's supposed to be here is hiding because they set us up for some sort of reality television thing and they're going to broadcast this to Earth? That's exactly what I'm saying. 10 strangers on the moon, living in the kind of luxury they'd never have in their regular lives. He glanced at Uchida. Well, most of them anyway. But why, said Dr. Weiss, pretend the staff is not here? Cause every show needs drama. Reality TV is scripted as hell. I don't think I need to tell you that. Even shit like Survivor. They have to set up these scenarios to give the audience something interesting to watch. It'd be boring as hell if we were just eating or swimming or whatever. They need to manufacture conflict. 
And what better way to do that than immediately shake up our expectations on arrival? Shows pull shit like this all the time, starting the game before the cast thinks it started, starting a game when the cast wasn't expecting a game at all. But don't they need our permission? Sasha hugged her notebook to her chest. To broadcast our faces on television, don't they need permission? She directed the question at Frau Richter. Not my area of the law, Frau Richter said, but I believe so, yes. You wanna talk permission? Okay, said Bobby. How many of you signed that 50 page contract they sent us? Everyone, including Penelope, raised their hands. Right. And how many of you actually read all 50 pages? Everyone lowered their hands. Not even you? Sasha asked Frau Richter. It's a trip to the moon, she said. I could never afford anything like this. There wouldn't have been anything in that contract that would have changed my mind about coming, not even having my whole trip televised. The ship is almost out of sight, Freddy said. I still don't like it, Penelope said. To get some sort of confirmation that we'll be safe here, that this was planned. Can't one person, a producer or something, come out and explain everything? It won't happen, I'm telling you, Bobby said. You watch the introductory video. The only way we can communicate with anyone outside of this hotel is that emergency signal. We press that, they show up, it's over. You think they'll let us stay after wasting their time with a false alarm? We don't know it's a false alarm, Penelope said. It's almost gone. Freddie glanced between the screen and the group. Well, I agree with Bobby, said Jackson. Of course you do, Allison said. What's that supposed to mean? Hey, Bobby stepped in. Here's a good old democratic idea. Why don't we take a vote? All those in favor of staying, raise your hands. Bobby's and Jackson's hands went up first, then Dr. Weiss, Tanya, and Sasha. Uchida did not raise his hand, but nodded in the affirmative. That gave Allison and Frau Richter the confidence to raise their hands. And then finally, Freddie. Sorry, he apologized to Penelope. I mean, it's the moon. All those opposed, asked Bobby. Everyone lowered their hands and looked at Penelope. She kept her arms crossed, closed her eyes, settled her breathing, focused on the firm ground beneath her feet. She didn't want to be the bad guy, didn't want to make the wrong choice, not again. And if everyone else was comfortable with staying, all right, she sighed. But if anything happens that even seems to threaten our safety, anyone's safety, even if the two weeks aren't up, we press the button. Agreed? Bobby smiled. Agreed. Now come on guys, we're on the goddamn moon. Let's have some fun. He grabbed a glass of champagne, hoisted it in the air and led the group into the restaurant. One by one, they grabbed champagne and chatted, picked their spots at the table, the heavy weight of their strange arrival lifted. Penelope stood alone in the lobby. Right, she picked up the last glass. If you're watching, just, just keep everyone safe, okay? Not like we can step outdoors if there's a fire drill or something. She downed the champagne in one go and joined the others. And that's it for chapter four. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, yeah, Jacob, you know, had commented on on the um, amusing undercurrent. There, there's this kind of overcurrent, I guess you might say, of of like impending dread. But there is, and I noticed it more listening to you read it than I had when I when I read it myself. That it's there's a lot of kind of amusing touches to it. So I want to ask like how about how you balance those elements uh, in your story. Um, not just in this particular scene, but I'm I'm gathering that that that's probably something that continues through the novel as a whole. Yeah, I, I like to say this is the least dark book I've I've written to date. Um, usually things take a much darker turn, um, but I'm a very sarcastic person usually. Um, not when teaching, but everything else outside of teaching. Um, so I guess I really wanted that type of humor in this one because it is, it's a ridiculous scenario. It's a hotel on the moon, <laughs> um, which will likely never happen in our lifetimes. And it's kind of silly to think about. Uh, so you kind of have to, I felt like you had to have fun with it. So yes, there, there's something serious is gonna happen and there's gonna be danger and doom and obviously very threatened to their lives. But if I didn't have any fun with it, then, I think the, the, uh, the reader wouldn't have any fun with it either. So it, it is a silly situation, a ridiculous situation. Um, and if characters were there, even if it was, you know, that deadly, I think because of this, the outlandishness of it all, there would still be a lot of dark humor among the actual group. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, the 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 scenario that came to my mind as I as I was reading it and listening to you read it was uh, Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. Um, I, I think that must be a um, uh, kind of an influence on on you in 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 this novel. Can you talk a little bit about your your influences? Yeah, so um, it really goes back to when I was a kid. My dad was an FBI agent um, and a real, like a special agent. So we used to watch lots of classic murder mysteries together on PBS, uh, but he was also a huge X-Files fan. Like I started watching it when I was eight years old from the first episode with my dad, because it had FBI agents and he wanted, we watched it together every episode from that. We used to laugh at the parental discretion warning. So I've always <laughs> loved like mysteries and weird stuff and and just trying to like it's trying to solve a puzzle um so when i started writing that was very obviously the type of stuff that that i wanted to write um and so and then there one is like probably one of my favorite agatha christie novels because it's one of her darkest ones um doesn't have one of her famous detectives in it it really is just people in a house getting picked off one by one and i love books like that uh, uh alice Fe uh feeney's daisy darker that came out recently loved it you know the paris apartment uh with lucy foley and her the guest list by her like i'm a sucker for people trapped in a location and getting yeah. picked off yeah um, no i was commenting to jacob earlier it must be a lot of fun to write a book like that um I was thinking of the the movie Murder by Death, which which kind of uh, satirizes that that whole scenario. Um, I want to bring uh, Jacob back on uh, so that we can uh, open up the uh, the Q and A with uh, Gina as well. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Um, yeah, so, so Gina, um, the line that really one of the lines there's eleven lines that stick out, of course, in 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 um, the memoir itself, but also the excerpt that you read. But the one that um, resonated with me where I underlined it twice in, in the excerpt you sent to me and, and in the memoir itself is um, we who had not yet grown into women would be left behind, which captures a theme kind of consistent throughout the narrative, uh, the feeling of being abandoned and lost. Um, and, uh, you know, near the, there's another there's another line later on in the, in the memoir itself that it's like so much of this narrative is about the inability to be alone and to live with oneself, like that that kind of conflict of like ab abandonment, but and needing to find it. Um, and like I think that that line especially captures um, that theme that's kind of consistent throughout the memoir. So, from a writer's perspective, do you consciously work to carry that theme throughout the memoir? Um, and what techniques do you utilize to keep that theme consistent, or you know, does it just kind of come naturally as you write it out? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little of both. I think in the beginning stages, these themes come out organically. And um, then in the revision stages, I'm really honing in and focusing on how can I uh, maintain this theme throughout the narrative through line of the whole memoir. You know, so I think in the beginning stages, I was just writing everything out. Much of this book was written first as standalone essays, and I kept seeing the same themes, characters, you know, um, a lot of recurring um, material in a sense. So then later when I put it together as a book, I had to really think about uh, what was tying the whole thing together. And you're right, abandonment is a huge, huge theme there. Um, first being abandoned by others, and then the narrator really uh, abandoning herself throughout the whole thing, you know, self-abandonment kind of until the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, there are a lot of avenues that are that are explored in the memoir and stuff. And um, like I said, everyone should absolutely pick it up and read it for themselves. And I don't want to give very too much away and everything. But like, you know, the first the it's it's split basically into three sections. And the first section really focuses on, you know, this this um, relationship between your father and this um, woman, Brenda, which ends up being, you know, very, very abusive relationship um, and psychologically and stuff. Um, Brenda does things that, you know, most parents would say, maybe I shouldn't show fatal attraction to my six-year-old, you know, or maybe yeah. I shouldn't take, <laughs> right, or maybe I shouldn't take my child to this house and say someone was murdered there and 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 stuff like that. Like, no no censoring, I guess, it, it, what, what have you and stuff. So, so I noticed that, especially in the, um, in the first part. And um, 
you know, the second half is more about your relationships with um, um, a, a couple of boyfriends that you've had and, and the struggles that they've had as well. And then the third is this redemption um, and 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 finding yourself and um, ultimately uh, by the end saying, you know, this is why I became a writer too. Um, in fact, um, one of the lines that stuck out to me at the end is that you you also say that writing requires that a person be alone with oneself for hours at a time. Um, could you kind of talk about that and and what that looks like to you and and how that helps you, you know, um, channel you know these truths onto the page? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think when I was younger the reason that line comes in is because it was really difficult for me to be alone with myself. And then as I grew, as I got older and as I grew more and more serious about my writing, it's such a requirement, right? For all of us who do it, as we know, um, this, this really intense solitude. And I don't mean that we necessarily need eight hours in a day. I mean, even if that's the 45 minutes you grab, you know, on whatever day of the week, but I do think writing requires such intense focus. Um, and I do think we sort of have to clear away the noise, whatever that may be for us externally. At least that's how I have to work. Um, I need a little bit of space to kind of get through the clutter of the mind. And then there's the sort of this timelessness that occurs. I mean, it sounds a little cliche, but I, I really feel that, right? It's like, oh my gosh, where did that 45 minutes go? It's almost like a form of meditation in a way when you're really into it. And that doesn't mean it's not hard or that I'm, that I'm trying to say it's easy because I, I tell my students all the time, the only people that think writing is easy is the people that do not write. <laughs> so I don't mean to, you know. Right. It's it's that it, I think that's a close cousin to, you know, the cab driver who has the novel and right or whenever whenever you're going to read at an event or something, cab, I, I got a story idea, you know, and like it's super easy. Why don't you know, it seems like, you know, yeah, <laughs> that that runs consistent a lot of time and it is very challenging and difficult and you do need to find that time um, to, to for solitude. Um, before I hand it back over to Paul uh, to ask another question for um, uh, Lauren, I did want to talk briefly because you had mentioned how these are standalone pieces. Um, uh, se several of them are. I assume that others were probably written to tie the memoir together um, at, at the end and everything. But um, because they're they're written as separate pieces, there is a lot of like uh, moments where you know, you might hear about this particular character in passing in one section and then 200 pages later, you know, suddenly that character reappears and there's there's a much more in-depth um, explanation of, as to who that character is and everything. So I guess, you know, since these were standalone pieces and everything, um, you know, I don't know if this happened naturally or not, but I noticed kind of this use of repetition as a narrative technique, um, not only like like on a sentence level, there's a lot of times where you'll say things like, you know, I ignored him because I ignored him because I ignored him because within the same paragraph. But also, like I said, in between all of these sections, like, um, you know, uh, Brenda's abusive um, um, kind of relationship with you and how, you know, there might be one you might highlight one particular uh, movie that she made you watch when you were young, like Fatal Attraction. And the other one was the um, oh, the Farrah Fawcett one where she kills her children like, you know, out of desperation because she wants to be with this man. I mean, this is showing a child this stuff. Right. And and yet it's revealed to us a little bit at a time um, rather than it being, you know, all in one central thing. How how do you use that repetition as a device? I mean, can you talk about that technique a little bit and and how can it be advantageous when writing personal stories like this? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as a prose writer, I and I do say this to my students a lot. I really believe in learning from the poets. So right, you know, on a line level, writing is really important um, to me as far as syntax, making sure, you know, every word is there for a reason. Um, so I do think you know, I use some devices like repetition, sure, for, for emphasis in different places. Um, 
And I do think it's a delicate balance, right? Because we want to convey our messages to the reader, but we also don't want to hit them over the head with it. And we want to trust them to be able to connect the dots and the details as well. So I do try to do that on a line level. And then as well, like you said, on a kind of a macro level, um, where there's these recurring themes throughout. So you mentioned, you know, the movies. And to me, you know, that's kind of woven throughout the book because there's also this theme of everything is not, is so often things are not what they appear to be. <laughs> so, so there's that kind of thread of the movies too, right? Um, you're, you're outside looking in on a situation and so often we don't really know what's going on inside that situation. So <clears throat> yeah, I guess, I guess it's metaphor in a way in that sense. Um, and so it's this thematic connection, but then on a line level, it's sort of increasing the tension and the emphasis for the reader. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll go, pa Paul, I'll pass it back over to you. Um, okay. Thanks, Jacob. I do have one more question for, for Laura, and then I'm going to come uh, put both of our readers on the spot and, and ask uh, questions for both of them. But um, Lauren, I, wa I wanted to ask you um, about um, one of the distinctive things about your fiction I've read. Now I read your your previous novel, which um, begins in a sort of a similar way in, in that there are a bunch of people that are kind of um, uh, come to a, a certain location um, and then things happen. The twist there is that I think it turns more into kind of like a psychological thriller than than just a pure kind of murder mystery. Here you've got like a science fiction element. Um, so so it seems to me that you are you are a writer who likes to blend different genres together. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, why why you why you do that? I mean, do you do you feel like you are you are um, uh, better able to express your ideas by pulling uh, aspects of different genres and putting them together in new ways? Yeah, I mean, I I love pretty much every genre. Like I read almost every genre as long as it sounds like something that's going to interest me and then it ends up having strong characters, I'll read it. Um, and particularly with this with speculative fiction, so some sci-fi thriller, psych thriller, dark humor. And um, I'm very eclectic in what I watch too. And so I don't like to be, don't want to be like pinholed in like one thing or write the same book over and over. Um, they did back things. It does get darker. I, I actually, I wrote that book because of how much I hate parties, which is <laughs> <such> <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, that's, that's like as deep as it gets. Like I wrote that book because I just can't stand it's partic particularly like house parties, the kind that existed in like high school and college. I despise them. I just hate them. I've always hated them. And so after a particularly <laughs> bad one, I just wanted to write a book where everybody that went to one died. <laughs> um, so it did get pretty dark there because I was like, just like, it wasn't, there's was no one person it was based off of, um, but just like, you know, there's random events. Um, so I'm like, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm just taking them all out. You know, yeah, if you yeah. have a it's, it's gone. Um, Very whereas good party. Yeah, <laughs> don't invite me to parties um, <laughs> unless you want to get you know knocked off in fiction later. Um, but with the um, the launch party, I didn't it didn't it didn't feel like it needed to be that dark. I mean, because I, like I said, it it was a much a slightly more humorous concept. Like, because you have to really suspend your disbelief about people going to a hotel on the moon and then willingly staying there, even then when things seem off at the beginning. Um, so I'm like, if I don't get more humor in there, I, I don't think. The reader's going to believe it but yeah i think mostly pick and blend it based on just because that's what i enjoy i like reading things that mix genres and play with genres and authors that change up their genre um and since that's what i like to read and it's like what i what i like to watch that's what i like to write very cool um so now i'm going to put you both on the spot um it, it 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 seems initially that I mean what what possible commonalities could there be between a memoir and a work of uh, you know a locked room mystery on the moon, and yet uh, listening to to both of your readings, it struck me that there are commonalities um, in theme. There's that sense of kind of like impending dread. Um, there's a kind of a sense of like um, mystery. Like what is what is happening? Like um, 
you know, Lauren, you have a locked room mystery, but but uh, Gina, you're you're you too have a locked room mystery because what is going on in in the bedrooms of of the parents? You know, that's the that's a mystery that every child wonders about and has to solve. So I want to want to ask you two to talk a little bit amongst yourselves about <laughs> about the element of mystery in 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 your these particular works, but also. Uh, in in your works generally and and in your motivations as as writers, I have to say when I, Gina, when you were reading and the description of like popping the your sisters or the sisters cysts on the back, I'm like that's a great horror description. <laughs> <laughs> like I could really take that and make it like body horror and make it really really gross there and, and you know, elaborate <laughs> on it. Um, but yeah, I think I think with like memoir too, it's great. It's like a story about life, a story about a person's life, and you're reading it and you don't know what happened to them or even if there's flash forwards and flashbacks, you don't necessarily know how they got there. Um, and from the memoirs I've read, I've, I've really liked that element of the mystery. You're, it's not like who killed who necessarily, but you know, what has gone on in this person's life? What has made them the way they are? What are these things that they've hinted at? The inside jokes or the references to family events that like, I don't know yet, but I wanna know. You know, keep reading, I, and I find that the gradual reveal that happens um, in memoir is very similar to what happens in a, a standard mystery novel. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because in the end, it's all really storytelling, right? <laughs> We're increasing the tension for the reader. You know, we have a narrative, but I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, when I teach memoir, I talk a lot about like we are investigating our past in a way. I mean, some, some people choose to integrate more research than others, um, but, but we really are delving into, you know, character the way we are in fiction as well, you know, and people, you know, are multi-layered, they are multi-dimensional, they are complex in fiction and in nonfiction, you know, so I think that's a big similarity too. Um, there's there's drive and motivation and desire on the part of a character whether it's a narrator who might be one version of yourself that that you've been or whether it's a fictional character you know yeah i'm telling when my students do their character development i'm always saying like well you want you're doing the character sketches and everything you want it to make it feel like it's a real person that you could meet yeah. on the street and memoir it is in, you know in a sense maybe not not that whole person but like you said a view of them um, but it, it's, you're taking those same facets and having to convey them though, through just, just the words of the events. Absolutely. And you, and like fiction, you know, I actually write fiction as well, not speculative, but I do write fiction, but there's still that element of, um, of, you know, displaying that character through different point of views, even if it's a character in nonfiction, you know? Um, so even if I'm writing about somebody I've known in real life, I really do try to make them well-rounded enough that the reader isn't necessarily seeing them exactly as I saw them at that time, right? The way we do in fiction, where we show these all different angles of these characters through different people's point of views, uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to bring a, a couple of questions up from the chat. Um, here, here's one for, for you, Gina. Uh, when writing memory memories that may have been painful for all parties involved, how did you deal with the notion that the others involved may come off looking less than pleasant? Did you just go raw and real or soften the edges? Well, I think it depends on, you know, the character or the person that's part of your story that's in your book or in your writing and i think it depends on your relationship with them and i think you know this is talked about so much in memoir and, and there's not an easy answer um there's a there's a craft book i love called writing hard stories and it's all it's an anthology of um different authors talking about their experience writing memoir but you know, some common things come up over and over again. Most memoirists are worried about what people are going to think um, when they put, you know, certain people in their stories. Um, but there just is no way to leave other people out of your story, right? Because 
there are other people that are part of your story. Um, but I think in the end, you have to be comfortable with what you're putting out there, right? We all kind of have to live with what we're putting out into the world. We all have to be able to sleep at night. So I had to really pick and choose, you know, what I was comfortable putting out there. And there were definitely certain things I was more worried about than others. I was mostly worried about my father who is still alive, but I'm still, you know, not in touch with. And I was, I was pretty worried about, you know, what happens if he reads it and that sort of thing. But the other thing I've learned, um, and this is where it's so great to have like a tribe of writer people, right, that you can talk about these things with, is most of the time what we're worried about, kind of like in life, <laughs> most of the time what we're worried about does not come to fruition when we're writing. Do you know what I'm saying? So you're worried about this person's reaction of how you portrayed them. And they say, oh, thanks for including me in the book or, or something like totally unexpected. <laughs> or they don't even <laughs> notice like that you base the character on them. <laughs> it's kind of a good life lesson. And I do change all names too, um, except, except for my sisters, everyone and, and my current partner, pretty much everyone's name is changed just to kind of protect people's privacy. Well, Lauren, fiction writers have to deal with that too, don't they? I mean, you're writing all these, all these murder <laughs> mysteries. Well, I've never, I joke with the students I know well that if, you know, you do something that's annoying, I'm going to kill you off in a book. But I've never actually based <laughs> a single character off one person. Um, I kind of uh, cherry pick a, a, a phrase that I heard in, in my MFA that stuck with me was information squirrels. Like you want to be little information squirrels and, you know, gather up nuggets. So I basically... When I see somebody did something interesting or an interesting quirk with their personality, I'm like, huh, and I kind of save it. And then I'll put it into a character, but mix it up. And really the only people that can tell are like my family um, and my best friends. <laughs> I literally kill my best friend's husband in the launch party. Um, <laughs> not, it's not, it's a, it's a backstory murder for the detective, a backstory case. It's not part of the, the plot, but I did, I did ask for permission for that. So I could use his, his full wonderful uh, British name that had a nice ring to it. Uh, but yeah, that's why I, I know some fiction writers will base more off of, um, Rachel Cusk was one of my MFA lectures and she told us in class, every time she has a new book come out, she loses all her friends because she based her, <laughs> And she was very serious. She, she based her character so closely on the real people in her life that the book would come out and people will just be offended enough that they stop talking to her. So I kind of avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. That is a theme across the genres, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so, so you have to kind of protect yourself and, and kind of decide just, just how much and how willing am I to give up this friendship <laughs> or, or this relationship in, in my life and stuff. So, um, yeah, um, actually going back to a little bit what you were saying too, Lauren, this, this is going to fold two questions here in, into this. Um, you know, you're writing sci-fi and fantasy, um, so you're creating this world. Um, how do you approach it to make it that world you know, plausible, plot and story-wise, with that creative imagination? And um, for this particular one, the, the one that's coming up, did you do a lot of extensive research um, on the moon to to capture what the moon is like? Or, I mean, was it just kind of all from your head? Um, how, how do you approach that? Um, I did I did some because I needed to know certain thing, basic things about like the gravity, sun, like how does sunrise or sunset work? You know, what does the earth look like? Um, so I, I read a couple books on the moon, a couple that included some accounts of the astronauts who have been there because they're the only ones that could tell, you know, have the first person um, experience. What's nice about this, the way I did this book, or at least was nice for me to make it easier is I, I usually write in the limited third person. So I, my, I can only put in there what my characters know. And none of these characters are scientists. None of them are astronauts. None of them are, you know, physics professors or anything like that. They're, they're pretty much regular people. So a regular person that's traveling to a hotel on the moon isn't gonna find out the specifics of how that actually works. Like right. what the, the, you know, the mechanics are behind it. So I did a little bit of research so that um, there would be nothing that glaringly like off about 
this building that's set on the moon and what could happen. Like people don't start breathing outside, you know, or <laughs> anything, obviously. But I didn't have to do a lot of hardcore science research for it because my point of view was limited. Like the main character um, is the detective, Penelope. Like, so there are some scenes and other point of views, but she's the central focus. And she's she's a detective. She's a detective from London who like likes dogs. And that's, you know, she doesn't, she's not into science. She's terrified of flying, which is makes, you know, for interesting for why she's there and the dark and um, small and big open spaces she's afraid of. Uh, so because of some of her fears I gave her too, it's like she wouldn't go into trying to figure out how all this works. I did say something about, uh, she looked up YouTube videos of what would happen if somebody dies in space. because. <laughs> I wanted that fear to go through her head and she's the type of person that would sit down and watch a bunch of YouTube videos about like what would happen if your body dies in space and how would it decompose and like or if the air was sucked out of you how would that happen. Um, so not as much as extensive research as I would need to do if I had written the book from like the perspective of a scientist or I had an actual scientist or, or there with it. Yeah, I noticed, I mean, <laughs> since there's that whole survivor theme and it's like, oh, don't you see? This is all just a reality show and everything where like you have these very gullible and naive characters that I could see so far. I, I told Paul this earlier. I was like, Bobby is the classic, like, relax, everything's fine. And like, I'm like, something bad is going to happen to Bobby very soon. <laughs> right. He's, like, nice. it's just... He's a 60 year old uh, C-list reality TV star. <laughs> <laughs> um american he's he's one of the two americans there so of course he was it was really easy to write him i was like i can be a very everybody else most british or other nationality you can be really loud and annoying and yeah. <laughs> um so I, I, going back to one of the first questions we got too because i didn't want to miss this one um what you know you're both accomplished and published writers at this point and everything um when you were first starting out though and, and everything what how did you approach you know the publication did you stay focused on one particular project at a time did you find it necessary to switch projects and and what did you all what made you ultimately decide to write you know and and push forward with the ones that did get published and, and stuff um well I'll, i can go first um my my debut novel was my mfa thesis project um so i had done my undergrad in cinema studies and after when I decided to go back for my master's, I was like, I want a I want to go in there with a clear path of when I come out of this, what job can I get? Because I'm tired of freelancing. Um, so I was like, I want to create one novel, like use this MFA to create a novel that I can go on to get published, and which is what happened. Um, what I did, um, I find that and to this day, I, I, I focus better if I'm focused on just one project at a time. I have a lot of trouble switching back and forth, unless it's the occasional short story, I can kind of get in there and, and knock out and then go back to the novel. But even then, like switching back and forth in days, I don't know, my brain just likes to stay in, in one world in one place um, before moving on to the next. So yeah, so I, I, I use my MFA as a way to develop the novel that I wanted to get published, an idea that I loved, um, that I really just put all my effort into to make it the best I could be. That worked out. Um, and then still, I just focused on really one project at a time, the, whatever idea that I feel most passionate about when it's time to start a new thing. Um, it's funny because we definitely have some overlap there and then and then some totally opposite um, pro things related to our processes. So it's funny because my book was really what I was generating during my MFA too from 07 to 09, but I didn't go into the program nearly as intentional as you did. I sort of went in to get my MFA and said, I just wanna work on my craft. I'll start submitting for publication after I'm done the MFA. I just wanna become a better writer. And I really wasn't intention intending. I may have been in denial, but I was just writing these standalone essays and like, I'm never going to publish a memoir. Like it felt way too scary to me to do that. Um, so I just kept working on these standalone essays until the point came when I could no longer deny that this was a <laughs> book, but it really originated in my MFA program like you. Um, but then a big difference is I do work on several things at once. Um, and part of that may have been, it was a long road to getting my book published. You know, um, I started it a long time ago and the road to publication was not short. So there were years where I was working on other things and then kind of returned to the book. Yeah. 
Awesome. I think they're both very inspiring stories in their own uh, way and stuff, too. It shows, I think, often I'd like we'd like to stress to our students and stuff that there is no one way to publication. There is no one way to having your work out there and everything. And, and there's just different. You have to find the best approach that works for you, ultimately. And every that's usually the answer to every single question. Like, how do you write? You just got to find that approach and stuff. And I think the best way to do that is trial and error and stuff. So. Um, well, thank you. I mean, this this has just been so wonderful. I, it, this hour flew by. Um, I wish we could go another hour because these are these were just um, wonderful pieces and um, really enjoyed reading them. Really enjoyed uh, spotlighting two of our our, our faculty here at SNU, um, Gina Troisi, um, who teaches in the BA and and not creative nonfiction, and then Lauren Forey, who um, teaches in the online MFA um, in speculative fiction. So um, thank you both so much for uh, coming. We really appreciate it. Um, for more about uh, Gina and Lori, uh, I'm going to go ahead and post uh, in the chat here their uh, websites as well as Twitter handles. You can follow them on Twitter. Um, we're so glad that you were able to join us tonight for Word for Word. Um, our next event is actually scheduled for January, where we'll be celebrating Penryn Review's Fall Fiction Contest winners. So keep an eye out on that. Um, for more information about the Penman Review and uh, recent publications and everything as well, please make sure to check out the website and I will include that there too. And I will also say have a great evening, everyone in the chat and verbally as well. <laughs> um, thank you so much um, again, Gina and Lauren and Paul, as always, for co-hosting and, and, and just taking care of all the technical stuff. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So, yep. Yes. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. And any, Thank anybody you. wants to like didn't get a question, if you send it to me on Twitter or something, um, I'll I'll answer it. Same. While, Twitter generous. Still, while, while Twitter still exists. There you go. <laughs> use use Twitter at, while it's lasting. Uh, I think I think Gina said you you're well. People can reach out to you as well. So yeah, utilize Absolutely. those handles yeah. until Elon drives it into the ground. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right. Why? Well, well, now I'm going to get fired somehow. I know he doesn't. He doesn't own Snoo, but somehow I'm going to get fired. <laughs> all right. Well, take care, everyone. Have a wonderful night. All right, Thank bye -bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.